Shall we start now? Just one moment. We'll just wait until everyone comes in. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone, and thank you to those who have joined us live. Some people are still coming in, so it'll take a few minutes for everyone to connect. But this webinar is being recorded. Um, this afternoon, we have To Tran speaking to us about anticholinergic drug burden. My name is Catherine Bennett. I'm the head of marketing and communications for EBOS Group. And these webinars are brought to you via our HPS website, but they're also available for playback on YouTube. So I'd like to now hand over to To, who will also take questions at the end of the presentation if you have any. When you want to ask a question, please just navigate to the Q&A button down the bottom of your screen and type your question in there at any point in time. I'll check that out at the end of the webinar and then we'll ask To those questions. If you need to chat to me or anybody else, there's also a chat button down the bottom of the screen. So over to you, To. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, welcome to Hexdesk Pharmacy webcast lecture. My name is To Train. Uh, I'm currently working as clinical pharmacist at Ashford Hospital. Um, attending this section can be used to count toward your CBD points for the purposes of professional registrations. This webcast will focus on anticholinergic drug burden. I will talk about an overview of cholinergic functions, the anticholinergic effects, give a brief information about anticholinergic medicines, their burden, and how to reduce the burden of low medications. Next. Okay, so anticholinergic drug burden can be defined as cumulative effects of taking one or more medication with anticholinergic properties. There are two main types of um, cholinergic receptor, which are called nicotinic and muscarinic receptor that can be activated by acetylcholine, which is a special uh, neurotransmitter used by our nervous system to, talk, to, to uh, communicate from one part uh, of the body to another part. Nicotinic uh, receptors are found uh, in the central sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system by stimulate uh, these receptors allow the rapid transmission of signal in the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. Muscarinic receptor, however, fail abundantly in, um, in the brain where they are involved in higher connective process like memory or learning. Uh, activation of these receptor in the smooth muscle can cause contractions. The smooth muscle most affected by uh, muscarinic receptor stimulations are those of the GI tract, bladder, heart, and airway. Example of cholinergic effects, when the receptor are turned on, uh, you get increased secretions, more saliva, more sweat, more sweat uh, decreased heart rate, improved vision, increased gastric productions. The typical effects we think of when we say anticholinergic tend to include peripheral effects such as dry mouth, dry eye, low vision, constipation, urinary retention, reduced wetting, and increased heart rate. There are also potential, potentially more serious effects, such as increased risk of confusion, cognitive decline, delirium, dementia, which increase risk of fall, fracture, and death in elderly populations. Anticholinergic adverse effects range in severity from subtle to severe, which may make identification difficult. In addition, some patients may mistake anticholinergic effects for a normal sign of aging or progression of their underlying disease. However, it is important to identify the issue a days can lead to further complications. These include loss of the independence and accidents related to blur vision, dizziness, or memory issues, 
increase pill burden. So we use another medication to treat the, the side effects of um, uh, anticholinergic drugs. Um, chronic dry mouth can contribute to tooth decay, periodontal disease, oral candidiasis, and difficulty with chewing, swallowing, and speaking. Reduced wetting can increase risk of heat stroke. And um, the last one, a higher risk of fall in um, elderly populations. One meta-analysis found that use of anticholinergics medication for at least three months was associated with 46% risk of dementia compared to non-use of an anticholinergics. Another large study demonstrate 56% increase in fall-related hospitalizations and a 29% increase in mortality in older adults who taken anticholinergic drugs. Anticholinergic can worsen a range of conditions such as dementia, hyperthyroidism, glaucoma, prostate hypertrophy, tachyarrhythmia. These conditions also tend to be quite prevalent in older populations. The use of anticholinergic is common in Australia with up to one third of patients aged over 60 years taking at least one medication with anticholinergic effects. Studies suggest that taking one medication with strong anticholinergic effects is likely to cause at least two anticholinergic adverse effects in over 70% of older patients. Anticholinergic drug may be prescribed to treat condition, uh, conditions such as urge incontinence and Paxonism. However, owing to a large distribution of uh, cholinergic receptor throughout the body, anticholinergic medication can have a wide range of adverse effects and adverse effects are usually dose and patient dependent. So therefore you the lowest effective dose and titrate slowly. There are some example um, of anticholinergic medication in this table. Um, so you can see that as for asthma and COPD, we see a lot of um, here in our hospital, uh, elderly coming in using teotropium, iprotropium, acclidinium or eumeclinium for their asthma or COPD, which you know, um, the brand called Spiriva, Spirioto, um, uh, uh, Brio Elipta brand like that. Also, um, to treat urinary urge incontinence, uh, we see a lot of uh, oxybutynin, a lot of solifinescence. Oxybutynin have a uh, high rate of uh, dry mouth and um, associate with dry mouth. Uh, Solifinacin use a lot as well. I haven't seen these three, Arifinacin or Bropenthalin or Toterodine here in the hospital. Um, there's medication called glycopyronium. We use it pre anesthetics uh, before people having surgeries. Paxonism, I've seen occasionally benzotropine or trihexybenadyl. Eye drops, uh, I don't see a lot of these. Uh, I've seen atropine, but not many of um, the other two. Uh, atropine also use pre anesthetic medications. Uh, this, uh, the um, anticholinergic burden might be unintentionally increased from the cumulative effects of multiple medicine with varying degrees of anticholinergics. Table two will show a selection of medication that have anticholinergic effects. So um, this table here, you can see they, um, they're not considered as a typical anticholinergic medications, but somehow they have a uh, uh, anticholinergic effects uh, uh, in, in, in their actions. So um, we've got antipsychotics, for example, clozapine. Clozapine is known um, to, uh, clozapine known to, um, to use in uh, uh, to treat uh, psychos psychotics and it, it working by blocking the dopamine and seron uh, serotonin receptor. However, it does have a potential anticholinergic effects. Um, it have a very high anticholinergic effects 
apparently. Uh, and then you got the lower anticholinergic effects here. Even though uh, they got lower anticholinergic effects, but if you use them together, it can increase the risk of getting side effects from you know um, these medications. Antidepressant, we have a number of antidepressants here on this side, have high anticholinergic effects. Nortriptyline is associated with lower incidence of anticholinergic effect compared to other dry cyclic antidepressants. Citalopram have lower anticholinergic effect compared to dry cyclic antidepressants. So uh, it prefer drugs of joys for antidepressant in elderly. I've seen a lot of elderly on these medications. Antihistamine, not many people actually taking D2 antihistamine. I've seen a lot of these. Cetirizine, fisoxfenidine, loratadine. In, in the hospital, you, you see that these medications, you should only take it once a day. But usually um, we use it off-label in the hospital when patients have a severe allergic reaction with, oral anti uh, it, uh, with the IV or oral antibiotics. So usually you see doctor prescribing them taken twice a day or occasionally three times a day, and it increases the risk of um, getting anticholinergic side effects. Opioid, Tepentadol, had a lot of uh, have high anticholinergic effect compared to um, codeine, oxycodone. Uh, Tepentadol now have been used quite uh, a lot in a hospital compared to endone uh, for the fact that it doesn't, uh, the, the risk of constipation is less compared to endone. But however, but then the risk of getting the anticholinergic effects is higher compared to endone. So um, unfortunately, that, that what happened. Penzo, uh, benzodiazepine, we've got our prazolam, diazepam, clonazepam, temazepam. So these one use quite regular in the hospital as well. And I've seen people on, you know, diazepam, um, five milligrams three times a day when required, or 10 milligrams twice, uh, twice a day when required. So it increased, you know, the risk of falling, confusions. Um, consider that, you know, when they're in the hospital, uh, they, they're already confused due to their um, underlying conditions. So we'll have to be um, very careful to use. Uh, oops, what happened? Okay, that. Next one. Um, it's sometimes difficult to quantify the anticholinergic uh, anti effects of medications and um, classification may vary depending on the assessment tool that we use. Uh, many different anticholinergic scales are available um, that classify drugs according to their anticholinergic potential. The sum of the score for each drug the patient takes is known as the patient's anticholinergic burdens. So one of the um, uh, scale that we use, uh, we've seen using the DBI or drug burden index is a tool that can be used to access anticholinergic burdens. It, use, it uses the formula that takes into account the prescribed dose and the minimum effective dose of the drugs. This validated scale assessed exposure to both anticholinergics and sedatives. The inclusion of the medication with sedative effects is useful as these agents can also have negative impact due to adverse connective and psychomotor events, increased falls and fractures, and daytime fatigue. A higher DBI is associated with poorer physical functions, Hospital, uh, increased hospitalization and increased mortality. Oops. Uh, uh, the, the DBI and other anticholinergic is in easy to use calculator, um, in the easy to use calculator format, so you can find them online. It, it may be necessary or um, it may not be necessary or desirable to reduce anticholinergic burdens. So um, there, 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 there is a possible, there's a couple of uh, strategies to, to, to use to be able to reduce anticholinergic burdens. Uh, consider non-drug therapy. So psychotherapies for mild to moderate um, depressions. See non-essential uh, medicines see non-essential um, medicines, uh, including, you know, if, if, uh, if there is a risk of 
but there is a, a room sometimes a doctor have to consider risk of falls against you know benefit of treating incontinence Re reduce the dose of anticholinergics or uh, reduce the frequency of uh, taking those medications Consider alternative aging with less anticholinergic effects, like, you know, so Talopram uh, may be preferred over um, dry, um, uh, dry cyclic antidepressants, such as amitriptyline, when trying to uh, reduce anticholinergic burden. The uh, discontinuation of the anticholinergic require a careful consideration. There is the risk that the underlying condition may worsen. There is also some evidence suggested that anticholinergic's connective effects may not always be reversible. Abrupt cessation may also lead to an anticholinergic discontinuation syndrome. This cholinergic rebound may present with symptoms such as nausea, sweating, hypersalivations, diarrhea, urinary urgency, and muscular rigidity. It may not be appropriate to seize or reduce the dose of medication causing anticholinergic effects. In these cases, non-pharmacological measure may be considered um, to minimize the impact of peripheral adverse effects. Um, so potential non-pharmacological option is for dry eye, we usually use artificial teeth. For dry mouth, we usually uh, use saliva substitutes or sugar-free gum. Constipation usually um, recommend to increase high fiber diet, increase water intake, but we have to be careful with the increased water intake because sometimes um, elderly, when they come in, they, they have heart failure, then they got um, fluid restrictions. So we have to be uh, very careful. We need to consult the um, uh, doctor before we give you know, a high amount of fluid intake. So in summary, um, anticholinergic medicine are associated with a wide range of adverse effects. The medications should be avoided in elderly population wherever possible. If it needs to be used, the lower effective dose should be used for the shorter duration that is cl clinically uh, appropriate. Um, and that is it. Thank you for, um, and then here's uh, some reference here. So you can um, have a look and um, well, uh, thank you for attending this webinar. If you have uh, any questions, feel free to pop up in the uh, questions and answer box here. And uh, now I think I will pass the control back to uh, Catherine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Toe. And thank you to those who joined us live for this webinar. This webinar was recorded, so it will also be available for playback. We have a question from um, the Q&A box. Thanks, To. Which ACHDBI reference tool do you use? So um, I will uh, I will pop out the link for you to uh, to have a look in the question and answer where you uh, you can go online and have a look and they got the online calculator for you to um, to pop in the number and then you can use it as well. I'll, I'll uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, so. Do you have any other questions, Karen or Daniel or anyone on the line? The lecture notes and this presentation are also available um, for HPS staff. And if you've got any additional questions for Toe, please feel free to email us at um, communications at hps.com. If you need to get in touch with Toe, please also just type in your um, email address down in the chat box and she can come back to you uh, with any additional questions. Karen, did you find it okay, Toe? Uh, yes, yes, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. 
All right, well, uh, our next topic's coming up in a couple of weeks, three weeks or so. To will be presenting again, thank you. And the topic is oral corticosteroid stewardship in asthma. Did I say that okay, To? You can repeat it if I didn't. Yeah, so um, it, uh, the topic's called, um, just give me one second, I'll get out the slide. Going back to Zoom and our... Topics is called. Um, sorry, trying to remove myself where this. Sorry about that. Oral cortis. Oral uh, corticosteroids doership. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, and Karen's put a comment in there. I think it's G meds. M e d s s. Yeah. That? Yep. All right. Well, we will stop recording now. And if you've got any additional questions when we've stopped recording, feel free to ask Toe live. I'll just stop recording now. Yep.